Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, my name is Peter Bennett. I'm representing Access Industry Forum. Um, when Professor Ragnar, Ragnar Lofsted produced his report, uh, Reclaiming Health and Safety for All, in November 2011, uh, we were a little surprised, to say the least, um, that he had recommended a review of the work of height regulations. Uh, particularly since in our evidence to Professor Lofsted, we made it clear that the work at height industry considered the work at height regulations to be modern goal-setting regulations which were very much fit for purpose. However, we did say that if there were any issues, these generally arose from misinterpretation or misapplication of the regulations. I'm now going to introduce you to Paul Cook and Nick Johnson of HSE's Policy Unit in Bootle, uh, who will explain to you the process and rationale which have led to the sensible retention of a good set of regulations and the consultation and collaboration with industry stakeholders to address the key issues of misinterpretation and misapplication, culminating in simplified guidance, which, because of the positive engagement and involvement throughout the development process has the support and backing of industry. Paul. Thank you, Peter. Hi, yeah. my name is Paul Cook. As Peter says, I work for HSE's policy team uh, based in Redgrave, and I've been responsible for the last 18 months for reviewing the worker height regulations following Professor Lofsted's recommendation, which was accepted by the government back in November 2011, if I remember rightly. Again, um, my colleague Nick is going to do a few slides for us as well in relation to introducing some of the um, resulting actions uh, following the review. So again, there's two parts. I'm going to start talking to you about how we arrived at the conclusions we did um, based on the evidence provided through various channels. And then my colleague Nick will talk to you about how we're going to uh, repackage, if you like, our offer, our revised suite of worker height guidance that is um, soon to be launched. But we'll give you a, a bit of a taster of what that might look like and also be around for any questions at the end of the presentation, should you wish to um, pull us up on any of it then. Okay. Uh, I should start by saying before I move off this slide, I do have a few thank yous, particularly to Peter, Peter Bennett and members of the Access Industry Forum. And I know I'm going to miss loads of names out now, but Peter has arranged various workshops and stakeholder meetings for us to assist with our review of the regulations, giving myself and Nick access to many experts as required. Martin Brook of the Ladder Association. Martin's been, um, I've been hassling Martin so much in relation to requirements for ladders and step ladders, and his patience is... Uh, <laughs> has been phenomenal with me. Uh, Chris Kendall for his efforts in putting events like these together and again helping with arrangements during the review. Trevor Fennell, Tony Seddon and Dan Don Ayres, all members of the access industry, who again whose advice has been impeccable throughout this review. Okay, this is, this is where our review started. This was the uh, actual recommendation made by Professor Lofsted which again arrived on our desks back in November 2011. So it was one of a range of recommendations. There was, a, I think, around you know at least 10 recommendations that resulted in looking at ways to improve various sets of health and safety leg legislation. Again, some of the uh, issues raised in the professor's report it's alleged that these particular regulations were leading businesses in some cases to potentially go beyond what the law requires. So they were becoming perhaps onerous in certain situations was the accusation. Um, also that perhaps there was some call that maybe they differed uh, a bit too much from the actual European directive that they were uh, born from, if you like. And again, these were considerations we had to take in during the review. Running alongside this particular piece of work by Professor Lofsted was 
I'm hoping you're familiar with something called the Red Tape Challenge. This, this government initiative offered an opportunity to business and general public to make comments directly into government in relation to various pieces of legislation that they felt were either unnecessary, causing them issues in their day-to-day -day running of their business, or even suggesting improvements to the current suite of legislation. Now, Red Tape Challenge covers all types of legislation. If you like, health and safety's period in the spotlight ran from round about the summer of 2012. So we had to take on board them views that were received into governments as part of the review. So again, the professor asked that we come to a decision on, the, on these regulations by April just gone, April 13. Just thought I'd re-emphasize the timeline we were working to. The red tape challenge, I should point out, technically it's still ongoing, although health and safety hasn't been in the spotlight recently. That channel is still open to people to make comments. Again, we, we undertook a lot of evidence gathering during the January to the August 12th. And for those of you who attended this particular forum last year, we probably couldn't have said too much to you at that time uh, because we were in the middle of the analysis. What we could tell you is give details of some of the evidence we'd received at that point. What we'd ended as a team, basically, we took our analysis to HSE's board and also took a package of proposals to address some of the issues identified, which I'll go into more detail shortly. We are at the point now of launching the new guidance and materials. They are just going through final sign-off with some of my senior colleagues. Uh, but we did complete all the review as required by the deadline last month. So the launch is imminent. As I say, we'll give you um, a bit of a taste of what some of this stuff may look like and some detail about how we've reached the point at which we have. For those of you who've just heard from Paul Blanchard, I think, although I'll talk about numbers and figures and percentages here, behind every one of these figures is, you know, there'll be its own tragic story. I was reading a prosecution just last night about a worker who fell four meters through a fragile roof while installing a solar panel, and that was on a farm. Looked a very similar building to the one that Paul was working on in his slides. And again, that gentleman survived with probably, you know, minor, what's deemed to be minor injuries uh, due to the surface he fell on being, uh, having some protection at the bottom. Uh, again, 40 deaths last year as a result of a fall from height. It counts for almost a quarter of all fatal injuries reported to HSE. Almost, well, the vast majority of those 40 as well would be to those who are classed as self-employed. More worryingly, um, we're seeing an increased trend in uh, fatal accidents to older workers. They're disproportionately represented in these statistics. The older you are, the more likely you are to have a fall. Uh, which results in an injury. And if you were listening to Paul just now, Paul talked about complacency. That he, he sort of defined that as the issue what may have led him to potentially have an accident. Again, we're talking about almost half of these, if not more, being in the construction industry. But a lot of the fatal falls occur on farms, out in agriculture, and also there's a lot of workplace transport issues and there's some new and emerging sectors that are having to face some of these, what we see as common risks in other sectors, such as waste and recycling uh, being a new, relatively new industry in um, the UK where they're encountering an awful lot of falls, accidents and injuries. It's the second most reported common major injury after slips and trips. Six, 653 major um, accidents in construction. And if you again look at the labor force survey statistics about the actual volume of working days lost as a result, the costs to not only the families, the individuals, but business and society as a whole is quite phenomenal. 
again, the final bullet on that slide talks about prosecutions. 65 cases uh, prosecuted under these particular regulations. Um, almost all resulted in convictions. Uh, average fines, eight and a half thousand pounds. So again, just to re-emphasize the cost that the, you know, compliance with these regulations, or failure to comply with these regulations can have. What I also should say, a deeper analysis of these statistics shows that probably around four out of every five reported falls to HSE is, a, is what we deem to be a low fall. In other words, you know, probably below two meters in most cases. So this isn't all, you know, you don't have to be nine meters up in the air for something to happen. Again, just some more information to set the scene, really. You'll see from this slide, when you look at the injury rates uh, for every 100,000 workers in industry, you can see that water waste recycling, alongside some of the more traditional sectors and in industries, 84 workers for every 100,000 workers has a reported fall injury. So just to get back on track with the um, regards to the evidence we used in our review, as well as those statistics you've just seen, we analyzed trends the statistics over the last 10 years to arrive at some of our conclusions about where the issues may lie. But we had to start somewhere, and when looking at these particular regulations, as a team, we had to go back and understand how they were derived, where did they actually come from? How did we arrive at some of the statements and um, rules and regulations in that particular set of regulations in the first instance? Worker height isn't new. We trace stuff back to the Factories Act, turn of the century. Then there was very specific construction uh, legislation. There was stuff in shipbuilding, docks, offshore regulations. A lot of it's come into regulation in the UK before the Health and Safety at Work Act came to be in 1974. And what happened when the worker height regulations were introduced in 2005? It consolidated the vast majority of those requirements in other sectors into one single set of what we deem to be cross-cutting regulations. So we applied them to all parts of um, industry. Again, this was highly controversial during that time. And when they were introduced, it followed a four-year period of intense consultation on, you know, not just on the regulations as a whole, but various aspects that were either being introduced or were removed from the previous sets of regulations. And uh, for those of you who are involved in that, will recall a lot of the debate at the time focused on the removal of the two-meter rule from construction, the two-meter rule being at which the regulations came into force. Again, going back to the professor's call for evidence, 67 replies, uh, which, to be honest, isn't that many. And the views on the worker height were, were mixed, but the vast majority did back the support that the, and the protection that these regulations offer. Obviously, the access industry and amongst that. Um, there were some proposals that suggested we could perhaps further simplify these regulations in certain areas, perhaps just applying them to, say, for example, high-risk industries rather than industry as a whole. And we'll look at why we uh, decided that perhaps wasn't the best way to go here. And part of the reasons for this, when we spoke to people in general, most people said they bedded in these regulations within their industries and sectors work of the access industry and other stakeholders have helped actually put good quality training in place, um, you know, advise industry on the best methods of work, safe systems of work. As we see lots of industry good practice. Let's not forget, this isn't all about doing more than what you should do to in order to comply with the law. Good practice about just getting good compliance with the law. And we see a lot of that, particularly now in the high-risk sectors where they've done work over the last 10, 11 years to get where they are. Demolition work, steel work, etc. Injury rates are declining in most areas in recent years. With probably the exception of the, uh, the wastewater and recycling information I, I talked about earlier. 
one of the key aspects to our review was looking at how other European member states had actually transposed this particular directive into their own law. And it became quite apparent that bit of a mixed picture, to say the least, across Europe, across, across borders. We received around about 13, 14 responses from our colleagues in the various European states. And again, there was still evidence of some rules, if you like, embedded into guidance, such as a four metre rule before the legislation applies in certain countries. Two metre rule was adopted in certain countries, similar to the UK did previously, but we've since moved on. There was not many countries consolidated their regulations like we have in the UK. A lot of the countries actually have very sector-specific sets of legislation like we did prior to 2005. So there's a lot of legislation still in docks, construction, offshore. Again, a number of states we asked, did anyone note any unintended consequences as a... Um, sorry, Peter, I broke it. Cheers. Any under, what we were looking for was any unintended consequences as a result of implementation of your directives. Has it led to people and business, if you like, be becoming a burden in terms of cost, time, trouble, effort as a result of having to comply? And again, although there was about two member states that did note some increased cost, that was coupled with a reduction in accidents. So the evidence seemed to demonstrate that the extra cost was outweighed by the decline in injury rates. But again, information across Europe was particularly hard to gather because we all have our own ways of collecting statistical information. When we spoke to our inspectors, we targeted inspectors for interview that had experience both before the introduction of the regulations in 2005 and experience of enforcement after the regulations were laid post-2005. And as opposed to actually finding evidence, as you'd expect, of perhaps over-compliance with the regulations, an awful lot of what they see, as you can imagine, is a lack of compliance with the basic requirements in the like, regulations. And we were asking inspectors, well, what, what's driving this? Is it the regulations themselves? Peter mentioned earlier about misinterpretation. And that, that is what we found. It was backed by our... Um, evidence in that a lot of people misinterpret the requirements in this legislation Now that's quite easy to say uh, for us because we're probably very close to this particular set of rules and regulations however it got us thinking we we obviously need to think about how we communicate these regulations if there is reports of misinterpretation in a number of sectors of industry and again a lot of what was being done where people went beyond what the law required tended to be driven potentially by fear of civil litigation or perhaps insurers demanding a greater level of compliance. So there was some anecdotal, mostly, mostly anecdotal evidence of that occurring. Again, we had a lot of um, information and evidence provi provided by the AIF, IOSH, British Safety Council, trade unions, they all provided statements and information to this call for evidence to demonstrate the need for these regulations and the need to retain the protection they offer. You will recall from um, an earlier slide, if you looked at what the Professor Lofsted actually said, he talked about any changes must not increase risk. So really delicate here. And um, the vast majority of people we've spoken to in the last 18 months and more all called for just better communication for certain audience of the guidance and the requirements in the legislation. And that can take the form of guidance. Worker height is one of the areas in HSE where we don't have an approved code of practice. And that's for good reason. It would probably be very, very generic and un perhaps unhelpful even to most parts of industry. So we call for sector-specific guidance in this instance to help people work these regulations into their own business practices. So if it was to sum up the review at this point in terms of where we are with the regulations, as we've confirmed now, with this was, again, backed by HSE's board, the evidence wasn't compelling enough to propose any regulatory change. 
So the regulations as they are now will remain as is as a result of this review. We had to weigh up the cost benefits. If we were to change the regulations, there's compliance costs, re-education training. There's also the amount of consultation that we need to undertake. And to be quite frank, we probably open up an awful lot of arguments we'd already had in the four year period and the lead up to the introduction. We could also risk infraction with Europe if we were to start to implement change that could be perceived as a lowering of standards. And of course, we were always going to watch the impact any changes could have on injury rates. So we've been busy probably the last six to eight months really focused on making improvements to the suite of guidance that we currently have on our, uh, on our books. And again, we've really targeted the smaller businesses, those who reported issues, which were mostly in the retail and warehousing industry, where they perhaps felt a lot of our guidance was aimed more at the construction industry, yet it's a cross-cutting piece of legislation. Um, other areas were mainly small sites, refurbs, um, motor vehicle repair workshops who undertake you know, worker height on vehicles, etc., and workplace transport stuck out too. So we've been reviewing all our guidance, particularly in those areas where we're getting a lot of reports of accident and injury. And this is where we've got to. This is a quick summary of what we're proposing to deliver in due course. A lot of what we found, um, and you'll be aware, hopefully, HSE now has a channel um, where people can raise almost like issues with information they've been given on health and safety, where it's being quoted perhaps out of context to challenge those decisions. We refer to it as the Mythbusters Challenge Panel. There's been over 150 cases now raised to HSE on various topics, and there are some quite common ones linked to worker height. It used to be, when I started on the team, you know, the MIF ladders have been banned from uh, construction sites. Now, we put out an awful lot of information about that, but that MIF seems to have re-emerged recently as ladders are banned for use uh, in relation to scaffolds. So it's sort of the same MIF come around again with a slightly different spin. So a lot of this stuff we're putting out and proposed to put on our website now is aimed at dispelling those common MIFs. Again, the engagement has been focused on the smaller end of the market where s specific issues emerged. So the guidance has been simplified, made mu much clearer. Simple do's and don'ts, you know, for businesses who just need to know the basics. If they need a more technical level of detail, we do an awful lot of signposting. So in other words, they're not presented with a highly complex document the first time they go onto our web pages. They're given the simple stuff first. If they need more, if they want to know more about scaffolds, mupes, whatever it is they need, they are then signposted either to their particular industry or to a particular topic. Okay. Now I'm just going to obviously hand over to Nick, who's going to run through a quick demo of what this guidance may look like. Okay. That's Thank great. You. Thank you, Paul. It's that one if you need it. Okay. Hi, right, good morning. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nick Johnson. I work on the same team as Paul over at HSC. Um, introducing the Refresh Guidance has been a, a, an interesting and quite a challenging journey over the past 12, 18 months. And what we did is we took, took what we had already and looked at it and interrogated it. And we said, well, what do we need to do? We need to remove duplication and remove some of the legalistic terms that you get in INDG 401, which is a guide to the law. We reduced the guidance portfolio by around 40%. So of all the work at height publications we had, we considered what we had and said, look, 40% of that we don't need. It's just repetition. It's confusing. It leads people to come to the wrong conclusion. We introduced some new imagery to support the narrative that we put in place. And we focused on regulation six within the work at height regs. When we interrogated the data, when we were doing the review, we said, well, OK, what regulation do people get wrong? What was the, the real stumbling block in the whole process that people fall foul of? And when we looked at the number of notices that have been issued, so that's prohibition notices and improvement notices, the most quoted regulation was Regulation 6, the hierarchy of control, the duty to plan 
work at height properly and manage to mitigate the risks. So what we did was we said, well, okay, let's, let's simplify that process. Let's simplify the guidance and put in place a simple step-by-step -step process. I think some of you may remember previously we had a sort of a pyramid diagram with a red, amber, green traffic light system, which was very basic and I think fell foul of itself because it was too basic and people got confused. We also simplified the web journey because it's fine uh, re revising guidance and leaflets and documents, etc. If it's not in, in tune with what you've got on the website, I mean, that's where most people get their information these days is from the internet. So we simplified the, the, the Work at Height website and we reduced the number of pages from something like 59, 60 pages right down to 10. 10 key pages of critical information, making it a lot easier for people to access the information that they need or be signposted to industry where they can access a lot more technical guidance uh, which is, is more appropriate. We've also introduced a dedicated web page uh, to help bust some of the common work at height myths. I know Paul mentioned about myth busting, but I thought it was probably uh, appropriate if we had a, a simple dedicated web page on the work at height uh, website talking about some of the myths. I mean, just off, off, uh, offhand, you know, we, we get asked questions like, do you need a license to climb a ladder? No, you don't. Uh, and these are some of the common things that keep coming up. We went out to consultation with stakeholders and we conducted quite a, an intensive round of workshops with numerous stakeholder, stakeholders, Access Industry Forum being but one of them. We also talked to the British Retail Consortium, trade unions, small and medium uh, rep, uh, business groups, etc. We also launched an online community which was a questionnaire that people could access and we put up the two pieces of guidance that we brought uh, revised and we asked them a simple set of questions as to do you think it needs improvement, do you understand it, is it actually achieving what we're trying to set out and do. The, the result of that is that we've got two core leaflets which are due to be launched in the, in the coming weeks. These working at height, a brief guide to the law which is INDG 401 and we've got safe use of ladders and step ladders, INDG 455. These are the two core documents, the critical um, guidance leaflets that we're going to publish which will help people manage the risks of work at height. Just going back to Regulation 6, the most enforced on regulation, we found that the step-by-step -step hierarchy that we've put into 401 is a much simplified process. It talks about avoiding the risk of working at height if, if you can, preventing, minimizing risk, etc. It talks about collective fall pro, uh, protection taking precedent over personal fall protection and it's not adopted a, a traffic light system, so there's no red, wrong, green is okay. It's about people taking responsibility. It's about people taking a pragmatic approach to risk assessment and saying, well, okay, going through the journey, what's the most appropriate form of control? What's the most appropriate form of equipment to use? And how do we manage the work in hand? There's uh, an example of some of the images that we've introduced into the safe uh, use of ladders and step ladders. You need to read them in the context of the narrative uh, which supports the images, but we've, you know, simple computer generated imagery. Green is right, obviously, red is, is showing people doing something wrong, overstretching, not using the ladder correctly. We've got uh, an image there of the one in four rule, which uh, is to guide people how to uh, set a ladder out from a, a, vert, uh, a wall, etc. And I suppose, in summary, in the next steps, there are no changes to the legislation. The work at height regulations will not change. They're fit for purpose, they're fine. What we discovered is that people were, were misinterpreting uh, them and, and why was that? Probably because the guidance wasn't good enough. So we've produced clearer, much simplified guidance. We've slimmed down the website. There's less focus on construction. There's more cross-cutting appeal. We've included shops, offices, warehouses, retail, transport. There's less duplication and repetition. And where appropriate, we're signposting to expert advice, access industry forum where you can get more technical guidance where appropriate. We're continuing to work with industry to promote key messages and working to dispel common work at height myths. Now, we're not going to do a Q&A session, but my colleague Paul and I will be outside if anybody wants to come up and talk to us about any, any issues that they, they want to raise with us. About HSE widely, and certainly work at height will be available. Thank you very much.
And like, what the reaction did you read? What can happen to the audience? Well, it's interesting. I mean, the expo was certainly always a good opportunity to engage with the, the wider health and safety community, and there was a lot of interest as to what's happened with the review of the guidance and the work at height regulations. Now, some of the questions that I was being asked was, you know, have the regulations changed? I mean, that's what's, you know, on, on everyone's mind. And the regulations haven't changed. What we've done is we've simplified the guidance. And I think a lot of people are quite keen and eager to see what the new guidance looks like and see whether it actually helps them manage and mitigate the risk of work at height. I mean, that's, everyone's asking about, you know, what, what's in the new guidance, what do the new publications look like, what's the new website like. They were interested. Um, the fact that we've actually slimmed down the website and reduced the number of pages so that it's down to a, a key number of critical pages with information on that people need. And it's a lot simpler and a lot easier for people to find what they need.